So yeah, my name is Rachel Tyson. I'm just started as an assistant professor at the Amsterdam UMC, but all the work I'm going to send to you today was all done at the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute in Melbourne, Australia, when I was a postdoc there. So first, I'm going to give you an introduction in the disease that we are studying, the bad blood, leukemic cells. And then I'm going to introduce you why we need to develop new single cell methods to answer really critical research questions. Then I'm going to go into more details about these methods and really show you um, how you can use single cell long rate to capture mutations and uh, novel isoform usage in single cells. And then, of course, I'm going to show you the data that you get with that. So first, an introduction into cancer. And I'm really looking at blood cancer. And one of the hallmarks of cancer is that they don't die upon a stress signal, like healthy cells. And this is often by the upregulation of pro-survival genes, such as BCL2. Now, research at the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute led to the, really uh, de led to the development of a small molecule inhibitor that only specifically targets BCL2, and thereby uh, killing cells that are very dependent on BCL2. And this molecule uh, inhibitor is venetoclax. One of those cells that are very dependent on B-cell 2 are blood cancer cells, and especially chronic lymphocytic leukemia, or short CLL. And CLL is one of the most common adult leukemia in the Western world. So the first in-human clinical trial was uh, done with in CLL patients taking venetoclax 12 years ago. And what they saw is even though these patients were heavily pre-treated, 80% of these patients responded to venetoclax. And this is just one of the patients that was treated at the Royal Melbourne Hospital, where you can see this patient had like, leukemic cells all over the body, a very bulky disease. But just after a couple of months on venetoclax therapy, the disease was completely gone. So after this inhuman clinical trial, other clinical trials were conducted, but led to the development of, and approval of venetoclax by the FDA and EMA. And now it's been used as upfront therapy to treat uh, CLL patients. Um, around the world. But it's not the full story. So even though most CLL patients respond to venetoclax therapy, after years on the, 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 uh, the treatment, the disease is coming back. And if, uh, if we look at that first in-human clinical trial of 67 patients treated with venetoclax, we, saw, we only see that now only three of them are still on therapy. So what's happening? Why are cancer cells become resistant to this targeted therapy? So the first thing, of course, to look at therapy resistance, and often in cancer research, is to apply bulk sequencing. And we did this. We applied uh, DNA bulk sequencing, and what we found was a mutation in BCL2 itself, so the target of venetoclax. This mutation was located in exon 2, and it changes the glycine on the one-on-one -on -one residue into a valine, so thereby reducing the binding affinity of venetoclax to BCL2. This really drives in resistance. However, we only see this mutation subclonally. So there are other cells within this patient sample that also outgrow under this continuous venetoclax pressure that don't have this mutation. And also we have other patients that don't have this mutation at all. And I think single cell researchers love this analogy to compare bulk sequencing with looking at a smoothie. You can maybe know what's going on, you can find the mutation, but you don't really know what's going on in the other cells. So therefore, we have to look at a single cell level to really figure out what is driving drug resistance in these cancer samples. Because I'm looking at leukemic samples, and often these patients have multiple cells within their body, I want to look at it in a high-throughput fashion. So the common high-throughput methods that are out there are the 10x genomics, and there you can combine transcriptome with proteome or transcriptome with epigenome, such as chromatin accessibility. The only thing is, if you really want to resolve cancer complexity, you have to link genome to it. And these are methods that we developed to link genotyping to single-cell transcriptomics. So a little bit of an introduction, what kind of samples we're using. So we're using peripheral blood uh, samples from uh, patients before and after relapse therapy, and then we perform 10x genomics on it. Just a really quick introduction, and you probably also can use my methods if doing other single-cell methods. But what it does is you capture a single cell into a droplet to, together with a bead that contains barcodes. Then you perform reverse transcriptase, so your mRNA will be reversed into cDNA. And when you're doing this, each cDNA has this unique 
barcodes that can link it back to the cell identity. It also got a unique molecule identifier, so you know exactly how many strands of a, uh, a transcript is in a single cell. And then you have this index cDNA. You break up the emulsions, you have this long-read cDNA that is indexed, you then further amplify it, and only you take a little bit to perform short-read libraries of that. And that's great if you do it, if you want to just look at gene expression, but you're losing all the rest of the information because you fragment that you only read out 50 base pairs if you're looking at the 5' prime or the 3' prime end. So you're losing information like mutation status or isoform usage. So instead of only doing short-read sequencing, we want to look at long-read methods. We actually developed two methods for it. So the first method I'm going to introduce to you is the subsampling. Because we're looking at 10,000s of cells. So if you would have done just whole transcriptome long-read sequencing on that, at that time it was like you have to run five promethium flow cells for one single patient sample. That would be a little bit too much. So instead of doing that, what we did is we developed an, a protocol to subsample it. So after you have the droplets or gems, what you do is you just divide it into two. And for us, we divide it into 80 and 20%. And it's just taking 20 microliters and put it in a different well. Then you're processing these two uh, samples as two individual samples and prepare short read libraries of that. But then from the 20% of cells, we have this long read cDNA and we just run it on a Promethean flow cell. So what you get is you get from all the 100% of cells, you get the short read uh, data. And then from that 20%, you can actually overlay the whole transcriptome long read data. And I think this is really interesting. We already published it a couple of years ago. And this is, for instance, interesting if you look at cancer uh, that has spliceosome factors and you want to look at it at a single cell level. I'm not going to go into this much because not, we also developed another method. And instead of doing subsampling, what we now want to do is looking at gene-specific uh, targets. Because often in cancer, you already know which genes you're interested in if you're looking at mutations or isoform usage. So what we do is a capture-based method. So the method that we uh, developed is rapid capture hybridization. And how does it work? So you have your cDNA that is stored in the freezer. You can go back to it, this index. And you can just design a probe panel of your genes of interest to pull down the genes and then sequence it on the nanopore sequencing. Because you're only looking at a subset of genes, it is really nice because now you can pull uh, patient samples together and run it on a Promethean flow cell or even a Minion. So how does it work? We're looking at probe capture, and I also put a GitHub link here, so if you're interested in your genes of interest and you have already stored cDNA, you can actually just design a probe panel. Um, what this script does is we have 120 base pair probes that is designed to each axon of 1 kb. If the axons are larger than 1 kb, we have multiple probes designed, and if the axons are smaller than 1 kb, what this program does is it lines all the known isoforms and then design probes to that. These probes are biotinylated. So then the next step, what you do is you have your cDNA that was indexed. You then culture it together with this probe panel with that, that has, contains this biotinylation and also blocking oligos. This is really easy. It's just overnight hybridization. And the next day, what you do is you add these streptophan beads to it for 45 minutes. And then you do your pull down. So you're really enriching for your target genes. Then it's just a couple of washes. And then we amplify the cDNA. But for the amplification of the cDNA, we use specific primers that we have. We made an overhang to it. And we call it the ONT overhang. So in the end, you have your enrichment of cDNA, of your uh, target genes, with this overhang. And now it becomes the rapid thing, because what you can do with this overhang is just using the nanopore cDNA PCR kit and just click on the barcodes of ONT. So you skip all the first steps of that protocol. You only have to do the last bit, just clicking on the barcodes. And this is the read that you get. So you have then your uh, gene of interest, of course, with the 10x barcode still on it. Then you have this bit of ONT overhang where you click on the barcodes. You don't even have to click on the barcodes if you're just looking at one sample. And then you have the adapter. So you can then pull multiple samples together. Then 
comes the analysis a bit. And at the WeHide, they develop a, a pipeline for this called Flames, and it's developed by Louis Tian and Matt Ritchie's group. And it's really integrating the short rate data and the long rate data. I'm just going to go into a few steps how it works. But actually, what you just do is, first of all, you analyze the short rate data. You're just using the normal 10x uh, methods for it, so cell ranger looking at which uh, barcodes are in the single cells, and then you can generate UMAPs or TSNA plots, uh, the analysis and all of that. But the important thing is then you have these barcodes. You know exactly which barcodes are in which cell. And this is what then Flames is using to demultiplex the long read data. So now you can also look at the nanopore data. And it's really taking out these barcodes, so demultiplexing the reads and aligning it back to the single cells. The next thing in Flames is also to do the QC step, so really removing all the artifacts, so really looking, does these cells now have these transcripts, have a poly A and a barcode and a TSO, so really have this uh, G, uh, QC step in it. And then it's just aligning it to the known genome, so calling mutations if you're interested in that, or if you're interested in looking at isoform usage, you can also do this. And then, of course, you then integrate it all together so coming back to my uh, research, the first thing what we did, were interested in was the BCL2 family members. So venetoclax only target BCL2. So we were wondering, is the mutations in other BCL2 family members driving resistance or novel isoform usage? So what we did is we designed a pro panel for these genes. There were 17 genes, so we had a pro panel of 292 probes in the end, and we just uh, did uh, nanopore sequencing on that. Looking at 17 genes, we can actually combine 10 patient samples on one Promethean flow cell, so I think it's really cost-effective. First of all, we just want to see, do we do a well enough capture? So what you want is you have the same UMIs captures in the short reads as in the long reads, and I think you can appreciate from this plot we're capturing the UMIs. Actually, we're sometimes capturing more UMIs in the long read data than in the short read, because you're not often not exaggerating the transcript uh, sequencing. So the next question, of course, can we now capture the BCL2 mutation? By just doing short read sequencing, we don't can not capture the BCL2 mutation at all. By doing the splitting protocol, what I showed you in the beginning, we see some coverage and we can find some cells that have this uh, BCL2 mutation. But now with applying single cell rate seq, we really see that we have nice enrichment of the BCL2 mutation and we can find it back in multiple cells. So then we're going to go to the samples. And now, how can we integrate all of this data? And this is a real lab samples from CLL2. This is only looking at the leukemic cells. So the leukemic cells are now grouped together based on the short read transcriptome data. And what you already can see is that the cells don't cluster together. So it's already shown that this tumor is very heterogeneous. Now, we can overlay the single cell rage seq. And what you actually can see is the cluster on the left side, or the right, yeah, the right side for you, <laughs> the right side, has the BCL2 mutation. So you can see the cells highlighted in black are the cells that have the BCL2 mutation, and all these cells clustered together on the right side. Now we can also look at what's happening in the other cells. And actually what we found, if we look at that cluster, the Selman cluster, you see that these uh, cells have a novel transcript of NOXA. And NOXA is a pro apoptotic gene so what its novel transcript does, it was a 22 base pair deletion in exon 2 of this really small uh, gene. And we actually didn't find it in the whole exome sequencing data because it was on a single cell level. We saw, when we went back to the whole exome sequencing data, we saw some transcripts, but it got filtered out because it was not high enough uh, expressed. But now we can only see it in, on a single cell level. What is really interesting, though, is when we looked at the novel transcript of NOXA, and also BCL2 mutation, we only find this novel transcript in the cells and not the wild-type transcript. And the same is for BCL2. We only find the BCL2 mutation in these cells and not the wild-type. And both these genes are located on chromosome 18. But when we looked at chromosome 18, we didn't see loss of the other allele. So it's already showing that there's some allele-specific transcription going on or maybe silencing of the other allele, and we're further investigating this. Now, what you can also do is now integrating the short read data, and we did that. And what you actually can see is that in the cluster on the left, 
there are cells that highly express a pro-survival gene, B cell XL. And this is not normally expressed by these leukemic cells. And also, you have this really tiny cluster that expresses B cell 2A1. So now, by just integrating short-read and long-read data into these patient samples, we actually see four resistant mechanisms in one sample happening. We see B cell 2 mutation. We see a novel transcript of NOXA. We see high expression of B cell XL and high expression of B cell 2A1. So this is now really showing that with single cell rate seq you can look at mutations and novel transcripts. But what about isoform usage? So then we're going to go to another patient sample, CLL6. And actually what we found is that this patient sample had isoform usage that was not really common. So it was a Bax isoform, called Bax gamma. And what this isoform has is that a complete deletion of exon 2. This is an out-of-frame deletion, so you get nonsense mediated decay of Bax. And what you can see here is that highlighted in black are the cells that have this Bax isoform. These um, cells only had this Bax isoform as well, but we saw on whole exome sequencing that it was a complete loss of the other allele. So again, just showing by looking at isoform usage, we now see also another resistant mechanism popping up in these patient samples, is that these samples just completely lost Bax as a pro-effector uh, protein. So this is just looking at, oh, sorry, this is just looking at um, the B cell 2 family members. But what's actually nice is you have this stored cDNA, and you can actually go back. So what we did is after we performed this and we published it, we still have the cDNA left. And we were wondering, can we just design another pro panel and look at CLL-specific genes? And that's what we did. So we just went back. And you can do that also for your uh, stored cDNA that's indexed. You can just go back and do another probe capture if you find something novel. And we looked at um, the CLL uh, genes. And one of the CLL uh, genes that's highly mutated is SF3B1. So now we were looking at SF3B1, and can we find this? So this is, again, just leukemic cells grouped together based on short-read data. And now we can overlay uh, mutation calling. And you can see in dark gray are the cells that have the SF3B1 K700 mutation. What edenophoresis can do is taking these cells and now ask questions, OK, we have these cells with a mutation or without a mutation. Can we actually look at transcriptome uh, profiling and see what's different in these cells? And that's what we're doing at the moment, so I'm not going to go into too much detail. But actually, what you can do is now looking at the short read data and say, OK, this is happening. We see different ex uh, genes expressed in the mutant cells than the wild type cells. So with that, I want to conclude. I just want to show you with just by applying single cell rate seq and long read nanopore sequencing in already stored indexed cDNA libraries, what you can do is capture multiple genes of interest. So we're looking at 17 genes. We're now making panels of 35 genes. We even have collaborators that are just interested in actually two genes. And you just can go whatever you would like to do. You can actually call mutations on a single cell level. And I think this is really important for cancer research, because it's already becoming clear you can just not perform single cell transcriptome sequencing and not looking at the commonality of these uh, samples. The next thing is also you can look at isoform usage, which I think is also really important for cancer research and maybe other diseases as well. And then what you can do is taking these cells and look at the transcriptome uh, profiling going back to the short read data. And with that, um, I would like to acknowledge uh, the people. First of all, uh, Jafar at WeHi that really helped me uh, develop these methods. Next is Louis Tian that really analyzed most of the data, and Honker Pen, my PhD student, that uh, helped develop this pro panel designs and analyze the data. It was all done together with my mentors, Andrew Roberts, David Wang, and Matt Ritchie, and the funding bodies, of course. And uh, with that, I would like to thank you all. I just left my re uh, email addresses on this, so if you're interested in the, in the protocols, just send me an email, and I'm more than happy to share the protocols.